well, I'm, we're really here to, to answer questions. We don't have uh, any prepared statement. Uh, French family is here, um, but they will not be uh, answering any questions. Uh, Debbie Mahaffey uh, was unable to join us. Uh, you heard her the victim impact statements. And it's been a very stressful day for the families. Um, we're obviously relieved uh, by the decision. Um, uh, we don't take anything for granted. Um, it was a very difficult process uh, for the families. It was very difficult uh, for the families to hear uh, Paul Bernardo's uh, evidence, if you want to call it that, um, his explanations for his crimes. Um, we're certainly also relieved, not just that uh, day in full parole was denied, but that the uh, parole board, with obviously reasons to follow, um, have uh, reaffirmed um, the dangerous offender designation uh, that was found by Associate Chief Justice uh, Patrick Lesage uh, 25 years ago. And, um, and so that's very important to us. It's very important to the family that people understand that uh, not all people who have been convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life imprisonment um, are also declared dangerous offenders. And so the fact that uh, Paul Bernardo has is, is also been designated a dangerous offender and that has been upheld uh, today uh, is very important because we do believe there is a qualitative difference between uh, the considerations that the parole board gives uh, when considering whether or not to relieve someone from the dangerous offender designation as well as whether to relieve them from the consequences of their life sentence. So in that regard, uh, we're very pleased. There are issues that I think have arisen um, today which uh, um, you may have identified and it's something that we have before the courts. Um, it's uh, 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 the parole board itself and I think you know, we're, I think it's important to say that we were very impressed uh, and pleased by the hard work of the uh, parole board panels. I think you can see that they uh, really rolled up their sleeves, uh, they took this very seriously. Uh, they obviously put in a lot of time and effort to understand the file and in, from our point of view made the right decision. Having said that, what is disturbing to us is that um, the entire criminal justice system and indeed civil justice system is completely transparent. For, for all of you in the media who were with us 25 years ago and attended the dangerous offender uh, sentencing, at, for example, or hearing and the trial itself, everything was transparent. So why all of a sudden we get to the other end of the criminal justice system and everything is, is not transparent? And so it struck us that um, when, the, the, when we're hearing from the, uh, uh, from the uh, pro board members about certain reports, certain documents, or even when Paul Bernardo talked about a certain doctor and a certain assessment, we only know what we're hearing at the hearing itself. That would never be permitted in a criminal trial or a civil trial. And um, there's another case of which the Frenchers and the Mojaffees are involved in, uh, dealing with uh, um, another offender by the name of Craig Monroe, who murdered uh, police constable Michael Sweet in 1980. And in that case, we're before the federal court on a very important, what we believe to be freedom of the press, freedom of information case. And as I said, the Frenchers and the Mojaffees have joined in on that case for the court to adjudicate that the parole system should be as transparent as the criminal justice system uh, at trial is. So that all of us should have the benefit of the reports uh, that, um, that everybody's relying upon and what Paul Bernardo attempts to rely upon to uh, be paroled. And the reason why we're not entitled to it is because of what we're told is Paul Bernardo's privacy rights. And there's nothing private about this. This is a public hearing. Paul Bernardo seeks a public uh, disposition, a, a, a public remedy to be relieved from the consequences of his dangerous offender designation, to be relieved from the consequences of his life sentence, and to be reintegrated back into the community where the ultimate test for the parole board is public safety. So every aspect of this is public, and I don't accept at all uh, that, um, that neither the victims nor the public at large, the media, is not entitled to this information because of the offender's privacy rights 
and that's the case that, as I say, is presently before the uh, uh, Federal Court of Canada, and, uh, um, and we'll see how the court uh, adjudicates in, in that case. Um, if Paul Bernardo wants his privacy rights, then he doesn't have to seek a public remedy, and he can stay in jail. But the moment that Paul Bernardo or, or Craig Monroe or any other offender who's been convicted of life, has been convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life imprisonment, the moment they seek that public remedy, their privacy uh, rights are, uh, are waived. And finally, I would say that even under the privacy legislation, there is a balancing that goes on uh, when you make an access for information request between the privacy interests of the offender and the public interest. And I can tell you in the case of uh, of uh, Paul Bernardo and in Craig Monroe, uh, the, um, both corrections and parole have held in favor of the privacy interests of Paul Bernardo and Craig Monroe. So, you know, you know I, I hope that by, by you um, viewing the, the, the hearing itself, I, I hope that you had questions yourself when you hear references to these doctors and these reports or incidences or whatever, and we just have to take everybody's word for it. And uh, that's just not the way our system works. So um, while we're relieved by the decision, we're pleased by the decision, I think that we have to examine the whole, you know, parole system a little bit more in terms of its transparency. Mr. Danson, uh, Paul Bernardo talked about a lot of things, horrible crimes and, and a, lot, a lot of words were used, but he never apologized to the families today. What do the families have to say about that? And would they like to address that? Well, uh, it's a very good question and it is something that we, we were discussing ourselves that, uh, uh, even before today, um, and it is in the victim impact statement, I know Donna referred to it specifically in her victim impact statement, that there's never been an apology by Paul Bernardo. There's been never any indication whatsoever of remorse. And uh, other than, you know, I think some self-pity that we saw today, uh, there was nothing that we saw uh, where Paul Bernardo, Paul Bernardo you know, it reached out to the family to say, I'm sorry, and that he's remorseful. What he talked about was he knows that what he did was wrong and it was terrible, but uh, that's something different than reaching out to the families and, and apologizing to them directly. Would Mrs. Price like to address that at all? Was he disappointed or something like that? No, I'm, I mean, they've been through a, a, a rough day and quite frankly, a couple of rough few months, so they're, they're here, uh, but they're not, they're, they're not going to uh, answer any questions other than what I've just said. It, it is a matter of, uh, they observed it, they noticed it, it bothered them. Uh, but didn't surprise them. Was there anything that Paul Bernardo could say? Well, um, you know, probably not. You know, I mean, I mean, you can't erase uh, what he did. But uh, nevertheless, um, it you know, I think for for all victims, even though it doesn't. Um, it, it doesn't make them, it, it doesn't eliminate the hurt and the pain and the anguish and the despair. Uh, it is a matter of observation that he never reached out to apologize. And I don't think that uh, the reason why, in my view, he didn't apologize or show true remorse is because he is a psychopath. And psychopaths are incapable of empathy or remorse. And so I think that it's, what it does is, it's not so much that it would make the family feel better um, uh, if, if he said he was sorry, because it would be pretty hollow words. But, what, but it's very relevant to the test that the parole board has, which is public safety. And when you're incapable of doing that kind of uh, apology and showing that kind of remorse, you're reaffirming the, the, the medical diagnosis uh, that you're a psychopath and incapable of it. Debbie Mahaffey uh, talks a lot about what this process did to her family that was trying, the family was trying to heal. 25 years after this horrible thing happened. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I mean, it, it's interesting because I've, uh, you know, for better or for worse, I've represented many families throughout my 38 years as a lawyer who've been victims of violent crime. And it seems some families stay together, like the Frenches have, and, and Doug and Donna and, 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 and their extended family have been a source of tremendous support to get them through this. Uh, and other families, it just rips them apart. And unfortunately, um, for the Mahaffey family, uh, it, it's, it's kind of ripped them apart and it's caused uh, incalculable damage and it's, uh, it's unfortunate. But um, having said that, they're still close. I mean, uh, uh, Dan and Debbie are still very good friends and, and, and Ryan, their son, is still very close. Uh, 
but uh, unfortunately, they're, they're apart. She talked about the preparation for this uh, hearing being particularly difficult. Well, I, I would say for both Debbie and for and for the Frenches, uh, this was a matter of, uh, of of a lot of discussion to a point where it, it really starts with we can't do it. We just can't bring ourselves to even do even attend, let alone write a victim impact statement. And that uh, you know resulted in a lot of soul searching and serious thought. And uh, but ultimately, and, and it's my experience, this happens. There was no way that uh, Paul Bernardo was going to be in that room. Uh, asking for parole without the families representing their daughters. And that's the determining factor that, uh, that uh, Kristen's and, and Leslie's presence was felt today through their victim impact statements, through them being here uh, at the parole hearing, and for Doug and Donna to be here right now. Are they planning to be here with the families in two years from now? Um, well, we'll have to deal with that when, when it comes, if, if, if Bernardo pursues it. Um, uh, I suspect he will. I think a lot of what he does is, is personal entertainment for him. Um, but uh, it is something that, uh, um, you know, I think this is going to give us a further impetus to go back to the government for legislative change. Uh, I think there has to be a, a different treatment between people who have been convicted of first degree murder and given a life sentence, uh, as opposed to those people who um, have fixed sentences and you know they're going to get out at some point in time. Uh, I think that the two-year review process is cruel to uh, victims, uh, and I think that the legislation should be changed uh, to at least five years apart. Uh, and maybe if you know people want to complain about constitutional rights with respect to uh, people who, who murder children, um, I would still say that uh, it should be a minimum of five years apart after the uh, initial hearing unless they have some breakthrough in medical science or a medical report that would allow them to bring an application to be heard shorter than, than five years. But my experience is two years goes by very quickly and it's, uh, it's unfair uh, to the victims. And I think the government needs to look at that and change it. What were your questions? Um, I, uh, I thought that he was exhibit A, to be frank. Um, uh, his explanations about justification uh, and uh, his self-esteem. I don't think that he had an appreciation uh, that he wasn't helping himself. Um, but as I said, and I mean this sincerely, I thought the Pro Board uh, members were, were very well prepared and, and had, had, had really done their research and understood the file and asked uh, important questions to bring out uh, some of uh, his responses. So, you know, we really do applaud the Pro Board for that. Um, but uh, when someone like Paul Bernardo talks about, well, what, what, my, what my trigger is, is, uh, is low self-esteem. Let me just take that by itself. In light of his, his history, um, there isn't an expert in the world of psychiatry and psychology that wouldn't tell you that his explanations were, were proof positive that he represented as a very serious threat to public safety. And even more so for the board, as they did do, reaffirm the dangerous offender designation, which is a very high uh, threshold um, of dangerousness. So um, I don't think he did himself any good. Uh, I do believe that, you know, as you know, that today's hearing was recorded. Um, and, uh, you know, not, even though this was a public hearing, neither I, the victims, or you, the media, are entitled to get a copy of that tape or, and get a transcript of it because of Bernardo's privacy rights. That's also part of our lawsuit in the federal court. Um, I think that there should be a transcription of today's hearing, and I think it should be before the federal court in our hearing, so that the court understands how important it is for the public to, uh, to view uh, the, the underlying medical reports. So if there's a medical report, and let me be hypothetical, say there's a doctor, a psychologist who says, I think that uh, Paul Bernardo is at a low risk of, uh, of reoffending, and he gives his reasons. Well, if that happened in the criminal trial or at the dangerous offender hearing, you would actually have that report and you would be able to go to other experts to comment on it so we can evaluate you know, the reliability of that report. That doesn't exist in the parole system, and I think that um, you know, I think they do a great job, but I think the public confidence in the system would be that much more if the system was transparent.
What do you have to say to your colleague, uh, Mr. O'Connor, when he says, uh, our role is not clemency, it's not for forgiveness, for forgiveness, it's a provision by law to rehabilitate pain. We have abolished death penalty in this country in 1976, but we don't bury them behind walls. We call them a correctional facility for a reason. Well, my response to that is, uh, um, I suppose he had to do the best he could given what he had. Um, but um, it, the problem with that statement is that it fails to draw the distinction between the overwhelming majority of uh, inmates in Canada who have fixed sentences. And we really do need to uh, distinguish between those people who have fixed sentences and those people who have life sentences, and then in this case, who are also designated dangerous offender. So I didn't think that was very helpful, uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and I think he's, he's wrong. Clearly, people who have fixed sentences, meaning they're gonna get out at some point in time, you, you, you do want to uh, get them out on parole, uh, to uh, reintegrate them into the society to manage the risk. But with lifers, that doesn't apply. So I think he, uh, I think, um, it, uh, you know, it, it certainly caught my attention. I was not, uh, uh, it, w it wasn't a submission that I agreed with at all. And I, and I might say, uh, I think I do want to say this, and I think Doug has expressed this uh, in, uh, in the strongest language. Um, and we'll see, he might even change his mind and come to the mic, but uh, we, won't, we, won't, uh, we won't let him. But Doug uh, was very, very upset. I think he has a very good point, and, and, and the families at large uh, have this concern. Why is it that Paul Bernardo, a lawyer, uh, is able to address the parole board at the end to make submissions with respect to uh, risk management, risk assessment, when the family's lawyer uh, is not able to rebut that or make a submission as well? And uh, I think Doug raises a really a, a good a good point, and it's something I think we need to pursue. In, in, if it means legislative changes, I mean, um, you know, the uh, the victims do do victim impact statements, but that's quite different than what you saw Mr. Connell do at the end, which is to make a submission why Paul Bernardo should be granted parole. And I think that fairness is is that the parole board should hear from the victims' families as well on that point. Is that it. Can you tell me who's all here? Sidana and Doug? And the... Yes, uh, and, and uh, Pam, and daughter, and, and son in law. Yeah. So, and uh, of course, Debbie was here with a friend. Uh, but um, as I say, it's been, was very, as you can see, it was very difficult for all of them. But uh, uh, Debbie just felt that uh, she had to find some peace and quiet at this point in time. So, thank you. Okay.